But in the youth group at that time was David Lowe's, and there's a few who probably could tell stories. That was one of the things that was always a question mark every time I went back to First English Lutheran in Lockport. Those who would say in the receiving line, when you were in high school, I never would have thought. But David's journey has taken him into ordination. He's been a teacher at our seminary in St. Paul and is now president of our seminary in Philadelphia. And this morning, he'll bring to us God's word. Welcome. The reading appointed for this day, the fifth uh, Sunday of Pentecost, comes from the eighth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. So Luke writes, Then they arrived at the country of the Gerizines, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of him. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demons into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion. For many demons had entered him, and they begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herds saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerizines asked Jesus to leave them. For they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare just how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The Gospel of the Lord. Good to be home. Driving up uh, 501, a lot of memories. I didn't veer off to go to the soccer fields, but thinking about soccer games and seeing friends' homes and coming to the congregation and remembering events in the fellowship hall or youth group or Sunday school with Mr. Smith, (laughs) a lot of good memories. Even of sitting in the back, back row, not always paying full attention to the sermon. I'm sure that doesn't happen anymore. It's been 30 plus years since I've been here, and somehow none of you have changed. I just find that amazing. (laughs) It really is good to be here. So grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from the living Lord, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So you're probably not going to believe it, but Pastor Wallace and I hadn't talked about this passage or this sermon at all except to extend the gracious invitation for me to come and be a part of the service recognizing my dad. But I wanted to begin also with the question and ask you, do you remember the first time that your mom probably told you that sticks and stones will break your bones, but names will never hurt you? All right, maybe it's hard to remember the very first time, but do you remember your mom or your dad or maybe a coach or teacher saying that to you? More importantly, Do you remember when you realized that it wasn't true? That even 
might feel like a lie, not an intentional one, far from it. Our parents told us that names can't hurt us to protect us, to shield us, to help us. The irony, of course, is that they probably told us this precisely because someone had been calling us names, and we'd realized firsthand just how much they hurt. I'm guessing that when I asked you, or maybe when the pastor was talking to the kids, To remember back to when you learned how painful names can be, a lot of us dredged up memories from junior high. (laughs) You remember sixth or seventh grade? The time when kids become unnervingly skilled at inflicting emotional damage on each other with the exchange of just a few words. Stupid. Fat. Ugly. Skinny. Egghead. Klutz. Loser. Nor, truth be told, did it all end in adolescence. We've learned some subtlety in the years since junior high, but not always compassion. Names hurt because whether they're true or not, they have the power not just to describe us, but sometimes to define us. The names that other people call us, and even more, the names we accept and call ourselves, all too often mark the boundaries of our imagination of what we can do or who we can be. They become these limiting factors, sometimes reinforced by the people around us. Scientists have demonstrated this in numerous experiments. Put a kid in a class for gifted students, and she'll score way better on all the tests and homework than if she believes she's in a class with the slow learners. The names we bear create the self-fulfilling future that can feel nearly impossible to escape. All of which brings me to today's gospel reading. Jesus is crossing over the Sea of Galilee into the land of the Gerizines, which means that he's not just crossing the sea, he's also crossing boundaries. Because the land of the Gerizines was in the land of Gentiles, And frankly, no self-respecting rabbi would be taking his band of disciples there. When Jesus gets there, he's confronted immediately by a man who is possessed. Actually, he's more than possessed. He's occupied. Because that's what a legion was, a unit of the Roman military. So this guy isn't just possessed by one unclean spirit. He's occupied by a host of them, dozens, hundreds, more. We don't know, but for what it's worth... In the Roman army, legion designated 6,000 soldiers, so we can be sure it was a whole lot of demons. My goodness, but his story is so tragic. He's left alone, wandering the tombs, and clearly a frightening hazard to himself and others. But Jesus heals him, sending the host of demons to inhabit a herd of pigs. In response to this healing, people are amazed and a little frightened, not sure what to make make of this. The man is grateful, overwhelmed by the experience of grace he's just had, and so he wants immediately to follow Jesus. But Jesus tells him to stay where he is, sharing word of what God has done for him in his own homeland and among his own people. So what's the connection between this story and names? Well, keep in mind that the first question Jesus asks this serious troubled man is this. What is your name? And the heartbreaking moment of this story is when one of the horde occupy him, occupying him answers, Legion, for we are many. I find it so devastating that he has no name, no identity left except for the one those who have captured him give him. He's not Elijah or Isaac or John, or Frank, or Jojo, he's legion. He's been completely defined by what assails him, by what robs him of joy and health, by what hinders him and keeps him bound, by all those things that keep him from experiencing life in its abundance. He's become nothing more than the name these demons have given him. And here's the thing. I'm not all that sure that we're so different. Don't we also tend to define ourselves in terms of our deficiencies and setbacks, our disappointments, grudges, and failures? Not always, of course, 
but just enough to rob us of the abundant life God hopes that we experience and share. Why is it that every time we want to take a risk, for instance, we're reminded of every failure and disappointment we've experienced before? Perhaps because we've allowed these disappointments to possess us. We, too, are legion. Moreover, if we're going to be honest, we should admit that almost everyone in this room probably knows someone who's been struggling at one time or another with addiction. Whether to opioids or alcohol or gambling or whatever. Or maybe we're struggling with that ourselves. Whatever the case, we can so easily get captured, really occupied by these destructive habits and lose our sense of who we are. We, too, are legion. And it doesn't stop there. Our culture so often relentlessly focuses on our deficiencies as well. Most television commercials, for instance, tell us that we do not have enough, even that we are not enough, and invite us to define ourselves by our lack. And especially during this election season, it's been startling to see how eager some politicians are to create in us a sense of overwhelming fear, so that rather than be grateful for the thousand blessings that are part of being a citizen of this country, we're instead beset by a host of fears and see enemies we're happy to call names everywhere. We too are legion. So back to the gospel story for a moment. I think it's really interesting that after healing this man, Jesus just sails away again. Which means that all he did in the land of the Gerizines was heal this one possessed man. Which might mean that Jesus' whole detour into the strange and unfamiliar place was to do just that. To rid this man of his demons, transforming him from being legion to being a human being again, and in this way to remind him of his identity as a beloved child of God. And here's the thing, Jesus is still crossing boundaries to do just that. He's still coming into the strange and unfamiliar world of our failure-ridden and fearful lives to cast out our demons, whatever they might be. Jesus says to us again and again that we are more than the sum total of our past failures and disappointments. We are God's beloved children, forgiven of our sins, healed of our disappointments, and blessed with an open future. And so Jesus keeps coming to tell us that that no matter how many ads or news stories or political rallies we hear telling us the contrary, we are not insufficient. We are not undeserving of love. We do not have to be captured by fear. And that as long as the future is God's, we have nothing to be afraid of. Sometimes, in fact, I think the whole point of Jesus' ministry and mission is to tell us, or really to show us, just how much God loves us. And in this way, to give us a new name, a new identity. That's finally what the story is all about. The Gerizim man Jesus encounters lost his identity among the legion of demons, but Jesus gave it back to him. And Jesus gives us our identity too. It's the identity first announced to us at baptism when we were washed with the Holy Spirit, marked with the cross of Christ, and sealed with the Holy Spirit forever. And so when we lose our identity and forget our name, when we feel trapped by past hurts, possessed by addiction, overwhelmed by fear or lack, we're invited to come back here to this church and community to have those demons cast out, our identity restored, and to be reminded once again that just how much God loves us. You are God's beloved child. That is your name and your identity, and your destiny. And this name is indeed more powerful than sticks or stones, even more so than all the other names you'll ever be called. You've seen uh, fit to honor my dad by celebrating the 60th anniversary of his ordination. 
and my family and I are so very grateful for that. He didn't want me to talk about him in the sermon, uh, and I won't, except maybe to say just one thing. At the center of my dad's ministry over those 60 years was the absolute and abiding conviction that everyone is a child of God. Even the people we would sometimes like to leave out. And therefore, everyone deserves respect. He, along with my mom, would remind us of that regularly, and I know he did the same for you. So may we leave this worship service committed to reminding a world mired in fear and violence and grief and bigotry that Jesus is still crossing boundaries to tell us that everyone, everyone is worthy of love, dignity, and respect. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus still comes. Thanks be to God. Amen.